Welcome to episode 228 of the Barcelona Podcast, home for the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and I'm again joined by Frances Tomas, Barca columnist featured on ESPN, The Guardian back in the day, you know where he was at. And Frances, I'm told you like to hibernate during the international break. Can we wake you up a little bit for the podcast? Hola, cules. Um, yeah, the international break, as everyone knows, is my favorite part of the year. Um that and whenever we talk about Neymar coming back to Barca, that's definitely definitely the peak of the of the iceberg. Um, no, I'm just delighted to be in the show again. Let's do it. Well, you might have loved this week because it was international break, and we also saw Neymar grace the covers of the local Catalan papers due to the fact that some of the presidential candidates have said they want Neymar back. Some others have said they do not. But unfortunately, we are not going to be talking about the presidential election just yet. It is due to be almost at the latest point in January that you could have it, giving the board about seven days in the January transfer window. So there's still a lot of moving parts there. So we're actually going to curb the presidential talk for just a little bit longer. But we do have a bunch of questions in La Ronda. So actually, without missing much of a beat about the international break, Rick asked, why is the international break happening if everyone is catching COVID? Most recently, Luis Suarez will now miss the Atletico Madrid matchup against Barca this weekend. Well, the international break is happening because it generates money for the national teams. I mean, unfortunately, football is all a business, really. It is a sport and it's something that brings a lot of fans, etc. And uh, it is, you know, the heart of, of, of everyone who watches it. But ultimately, it is a business that lots of multi- multinational corporations depend on. And uh, until that changes, which basically is never going to change, then we just need to get used to the fact that, you know, these these competitions are continuing to arise. For example, this Nations League that's happening, uh, I'm sorry, but that to me is nothing more than uh, a summer friendly co- competition outside of summer. You know, it, it doesn't mean anything. I know that probably in the minority here again, which I seem to be a lot of the time. I, actually, I don't know if you're in the minority about the Nations League, just because I try to think about why well, I know that. Portugal beat the Netherlands in the final. But if you ask me who were the four teams in that competition last year, I cannot remember the final four in that competition. I just, it doesn't have any history. And I think what we've learned over time with football is that it's hard to create history. Sometimes some certain competitions and the right place and the right time do that. But it's really hard to manufacture meaning to something that doesn't have years and years and years and years of meaning. It's why people argue in the UK about the FA Cup so much, because the FA Cup does have history. And so to see it being marginalized just because it's, it, it's not, it doesn't bring in the most cash and it doesn't have the biggest broadcast deal, that winds up being a, a point of consternation. So, yeah, I mean, but you're right. You're absolutely right. It's the federations looking for some money because they need it because it's been a long time since they had it. And even today, as we talk about money, it's not just the federations, but they do in, work in tandem to a degree with these leagues. And we saw the numbers that rolled out today as far as the teams in the Liga and the financial losses that they were taking. And some of those numbers with the new salary caps in La Liga that have been reported today, over 600 million euros in total in La Liga, 228 million Barca is down, 172 for Real Madrid, and 126 down for Atletico Madrid. So those are losses on the salary cap numbers, and we're at a point now that we're learning that Bartomeu and Barcelona are going to wind up, and we don't know how much of it Bartomeu owes, but 800 million euros is going to be the loss by this summer, which is absolutely insane to think about. And it's almost hard to focus back what's on the pitch, but we got questions from Dirk, Motaha, Rohit, and Minor, all basically asking, Sergio Busquets was injured for Spain. He's going to be out for probably at least a week. So Atletico Madrid and Dinamo Kiev he'll probably miss, and then also Suna, he even could be back for uh, in just over a week's time. So with Busquets injured, they all ask some kind of combination of what is, what is Coleman going to do on Saturday against Atletico Madrid? Well, it is pretty likely that Pjanic and De Jong are going to be the starters. I don't think I'm, you know, I'm surprising anyone with saying that. Um, I think it is it's unfortunate that Busquets is injured. I mean, no one wants any player in the, in the team to ever get injured. But having said that, um, because it's not serious and hopefully it's going to be around 10 days, it may actually be good news for 
el fondo de armario, uh, which is the bottom of the cupboard. Um, so, the, so the players that are further down the peck in order. Um, Carla Salagna and Ricky Puch, obviously we've been saying pretty much every week that um, deserve more playing time. Um, and, you know, either it's up to the manager, obviously, to give it. But with um, Pjanic and the young most likely to start, I think that, you know, that third position would probably go to Alanya in terms of um, experience. I mean, he's older. But then again, Ricky Puch was very good at the end of last season, so he could get a sniff as well. I think that, you know, it is an opportunity for, for Pjanic to start and to definitely establish himself in the starting eleven. There was uh, a huge survey in sport late last week, actually. And uh, in that, it said that over 75% of people in Catalonia or sports readers, which obviously is a sports newspaper in Spanish from Catalonia, so it would be the local readers mostly, um, over 75% uh, were actually wanted Pjanic to start over Busquets. And this was before Busquets' injury. So I think that uh, Pjanic has a golden opportunity. But I'm, I'm excited about that. But I'm even more excited to see who comes as a third option Obviously, for me, uh, it would be Ricky Puch. Um, he's got, in my eyes, more potential than Alanya at this moment in his career. He's got more of a point to prove, and he's been better for Barca most recently. Granted, not as a double pivot, but if that's the scheme that Kuman wants to go for, and that's the position that Ricky Puch seems to be allocated for, then so be it. Um, I am excited to see what um, both youngsters, but certainly Ricky, have to offer. Yeah, it's tough, friends. As every time I think of the def- double pivot or defensive midfield depth chart, I'm always reminded of the Mateus Fernandez deal. And it's unfortunate because I, I was doing some soul searching. I know I've had some fun at throwing his name out there at his expense, but it's actually not the fault of the player. He, he's never suited up for Barcelona, and that deal was only done due to some Brazilian commissions that we have spoken about in the past before, which are pretty shady business. So that's a little aside, and I think that's right. It's going to be De Jong and Pjanic. There's, there really is no other option. Those two are just above and beyond, and Alenia has only gotten a few minutes this season, and we have seen Puj once as well coming on in the dying seconds when the team was desperate against Adafe, and it was six forwards, and then it was Puj basically playing as a defensive midfield in front of, what was it, two center backs at the time? So it was really unorthodox. I, I don't think we've really Really, truly seen either in a role and minutes where they would, would flourish this season. So I, I think the question then becomes about what happens to these two next, because we also saw that they would be two players to go out on loan. Can't possibly see the club selling them. I know that, and here's the next question here, as we talk about the January transfer window, it's who's going to be sold, who's going to be sacrificed to help keep the club's finances afloat. That question coming from Greg, uh, as well as with the salary cuts, because even though the players, agents, and the club have both admitted that they would like to do those salary cuts. No numbers have been agreed upon at all. So that will, they will continue to extend that as long as humanly possible. But if that doesn't get done, then certainly, yes, players will have to be sold just outright or sacrificed to potentially help bring that number down to as reasonable as possible. Pretty simple equation. The less debt you have, even if they're going to be in major, major debt as they're heading towards bankruptcy, the less debt you have to deal with still winds up being better in the long run. So we asked the question about who will be sold sacrifices, and I and I still don't think that the club, particularly a management committee like Carlos Tusquets is currently leading, they're not in a position to get rid of Puj and Alenia, especially if Coleman in eighth place or seventh place or whatever Barcelona are in under Ronald Coleman, and he winds up just being a, a stopgap for this season. So I, I think you, you, we had spoken about this even, you and I back and forth over the phone, and the, the names you gave me were pretty simple as to there's basically four candidates, and I'll, I'll let you go here. Okay, um, so I think the four sales are quite obvious. Not obvious in the sense that they will happen, but it's obvious in the sense of who it should be. I mean, Junior Firpo clearly has not established himself anywhere near the starting eleven. I think that Jordi Alba, whenever his fit starts, and Junior has not posed any challenge whatsoever for that. And to be honest, we don't even know if he's a good backup uh, because he really hasn't had the chance to do it. And uh, if he hasn't been given the chance, it's probably because he doesn't deserve it, obviously, in the eyes of the manager. Then beyond that, I think Umtiti has been doing next to nothing for the last arguably three years. Um, It pains my heart to say this because when Umtiti came to Barca, especially the first year and a half, he was incredible, but obviously the life of a footballer is always affected. But I'm not just about how fit you are mentally, which he was fairly fit at the time, 
but also how fit you are physically and uh, the injuries that Umtiti has has had over his career and um, his unwillingness to take the advice of the of the doctors or the Barca doctors in order to heal and get better, um, obviously prioritizing his national team at the time, um, that hasn't helped him and he's just nowhere near the player he once was. But um, his salary is extortionate considering the rendimiento, considering the performances that he's given on the pitch, which is obviously next to zero. So in my eyes, MTT needs to go as well. Um, obviously, <laughs> good luck to Barca and Carlos Tusquets, who obviously is in charge of the club now, finding a club that can pay his salary and is, I'm not going to say silly enough, but is willing to take a risk on um, hiring MTT at this moment in his career. Um, Mateus Fernandez, you've already mentioned. I mean, um, I was watching Onza, which is one, which is one of my favorite shows from Catalonia Radio that has actually gone to Catalan TV now. Um, unfortunately for me, it's not on podcast form anymore. Um, I used to hear that pretty much every night. But anyway, I digress. Um, there was um, um, Villa Joana, who was part of the Bartomeu Junta Directiva, part of the Bartomeu board, um, not that long ago. Obviously, when they they just stopped working for Barca uh, around a month ago now, and, and rightly so. And uh, he was saying that despite being part of the of the board, he he himself did not understand why Mateus Fernandez was ever signed, and he definitely doesn't understand why he was signed for that much money. Um, he didn't necessarily throw Bartomeu under the bus, uh, literally, but he he couldn't but give away that the, the, the signing made no sense whatsoever. And he said that if he'd been consulted or he'd been part of the sporting part of the club, that, that transfer would have never happened. He then sort of stopped taking questions that went deeper as to the reasons and, you know, why do we seem to get Brazilian players all the time? And uh, he basically uh, played the politician that he is himself and uh, the businessman that he is himself as well. And he started deflecting questions. But I think from a sporting perspective, there is no way that Mateus should be at Barca. Um, he's nowhere near close to the required level of quality that is necessary to to play for this club. I mean, if Ricky Puig and Alanya are not really playing, then this guy has got no chance. And for me, the fourth option to leave, um, I think will come as no surprise, is Martin Braithwaite. Um, signed for 18 million euros last winter. Um, hasn't really featured at all. Uh, the first, I would say his first four or five performances were fairly good. And um, they, you know, he could add more than the players at the time, especially Griezmann, were offering. But ever since, he's been diluting. He's been not really having a sniff at um, having a chance to prove his worth. Um, I don't think he's a player that has got no place at Barca. On the contrary, I think he could have added quite a bit if he'd been trusted. But he just has not. And given the financial situation of the club, if um, there are three, four players that have to go, he has to be, he has to be one of the candidates, unfortunately. Yeah, I'll respond, but let's hit a break first. Yeah, those are the four candidates for me as well. It doesn't affect the long-term future of the club, and for different reasons, those four wind up being the leading candidates. Uh, Junior Firpo, I spoke about as there was a story this week since the last time we did the pod about Alejandro Balde, now Barca B, but really Juvenil A, left back who actually has been out this entire season. He was injured in the preseason for Barca B, and he is not yet featured even for Pimienta this year. But people were really telling, uh, giving me the the, the two cents about how Fati did the same thing going from the Juvenil A to the first team. But not only was that one unprecedented, but uh, I also had the receipts, as I've been joking with people in our close Facebook group, that I mentioned, now we're talking a year and a half ago, or almost two years ago, that I mentioned that he was one of the best players in La Masia at any age level, that he is the, pro- the most, probably the most promising left back we have had since Grimaldo, and it's not close. It's basically Grimaldo, who is now 25 years old, and you're talking seven, eight years difference between he and Balde, and Balde is the next best left back that we have ever seen in La Masia, and he's been there in, in the academy, I mean, for close to nine years now. But he has been injured, and so to expect a 17-year-old, uh, he'll soon be 18, but to expect him to be thrown right into the water without ever getting acclimated this season, again, it might take him a full six months of the Barca B season to basically get his fitness back in a way that Ansu Fadi, when he debuted with the first team with Anessa Valverde, he was coming off a torrid 
preseason with Barca B where he could not stop scoring for the B team. He never made an official appearance, but it's just it's apples and oranges to what is expected of those two players. And for Alejandro Balde, listen, I would love to see a La Masia player. I think he is the left back of the future for the club. And this is one of those examples where, as you mentioned, Frances, no, not every La Masia player is, is ever going to feature with the first team. But that's why whenever I do these La Masia updates every few months, it seems like the same five, six, seven names keep popping up. Because when you talked about the Puj and the Fati of the world, and even though, yes, Pedri was not in La Masia, but even Araujo, where he kind of went up that depth chart rather quickly, surprisingly. And Conrad De La Fuente has pushed his way in there as well. We've got questions, actually, about Umtiti and De La Fuente. So, again, I'm just going to agree with you on the January points, and then we will move on from there for this Umtiti question. Musa asks, what are the chances of Umtiti coming back to his former self before the end of the season? And Frances kind of already hit this, and I will add this, add the stats to it, as you know I'm one to do. He will be, and this is a surprising number more than any other for me, his age. He'll be 28 in less than a month. That's how old he got so quick, we'll say. So from 2011 to 2016, Umtiti made 170 appearances for Lyon. Then in the next five years of, of his career at Barca, only 116 appearances. And as Frances mentioned, 43 in 2016, 40 in 1718, 15 in 18, 19 after winning the World Cup and the whole surgery thing. We don't need to rehash that. Then 18 appearances last season, and obviously zero so far this year. The truth of the matter is that he will never be back to what he was in his first two seasons. He was a top five center back there for a while. Honestly, he was quick, strong, terrific with a left-footed pass, both short and long passing. But his injuries since then are things you don't come back from. And yes, it is the knee stuff, but from that we've seen what are unrelated, but obviously related when you deal with bad knees. He now has back and foot stuff as well. And he's still, again, just going to be 28. But best case scenario, he's the third center back. But as you also mentioned, Frances, his wages are of that of a starter. So that's the big problem. You cannot have a starter. You can't, you can't have starter wages at the, at the center back position as your backup center back. It just, you cannot construct a team like that. And it's one of the many, 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 many other issues at the club is currently dealing with when you're speaking of that. But that brings up a question for you coming from Poncho. With the club having financial issues, rumors are spreading around saying we could get a center back on loan, whether Rudiger from Chelsea, Matip from Liverpool, if not Eric Garcia, who could most likely come for free over the summer as opposed to paying for it. And you and I both agreed on that, that it makes much more sense, even with a depleted squad, to wait on Eric Garcia for free if he really wants to come to the club in the summer. But the other option then, Pancho asked, is it better to call up a B-team player as well and give valuable minutes and potentially a future investment in youth? So, Frances, what would you do here? Do you think that the center back position, if you're really going to try to sell Umtiti, do you think then it is panic button enough that you should bring in a center back on loan, like Kevin Prince Boateng situation? Should you bring somebody like that or should you just go with a B team player as the fourth center back I think that regular listeners to the podcast already know my answer before I say uh, for me it makes no sense to invest any money on any center back right now unless it's going to be someone who's going to be a long 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 term solution um, you've got obviously the only candidate that has been rumored and I think the only candidate that makes sense for us is Eddie Garcia, but as you mentioned, given the economic situation and the fact that he's um, head and shoulders determined to come back, then you just wait for another six months and you just bring him back. I mean, let's face it, this is not the season in which we are challenging for a treble. This is not a season in which, you know, you've got peak Messi and peak Suarez and peak Neymar and it's now or never. That's not the case. So I think that given the financial situation, um, Eddie Garcia has to be the one coming back, especially, you know, if, if he's that determined to come. Then with that in mind, you just go to the B team and see. I mean, you're the La Masia B team expert. I mean, Guetta, for example, is someone who has been rumored for a while to be able to, to do the jump. Um, to be honest, though, I think that the option for centre-back should not really, the third option for centre-back should not really come from Barca B. I think the, the, the option once the two starters, uh, so you've got Lenle, you've got Piqué, then you've got Araujo, obviously. I think option four shouldn't really be, in terms of preparation, um, someone coming from Barca B, I think option four should be Frankie de Jong, to be honest. And then you've got, obviously, Busquets will come back to, to life, to full fitness. So you've got Busquets and Piani who can play in the double pivot. We've already spoken about Alan Yan, Ricky Puch, which, um, by the way, both of them are rumored to be leaving on a loan. Um, you mentioned this already, saying that they shouldn't be sold. I agree with that. 
but I wouldn't put both of them out on a loan. I would keep at least one of them. And if I was to keep one, linking to what I said before, it would be Ricky Pucci in my eyes because he can play in many more different positions more successfully and he's proven that more recently as well. So I think that, you know, if you got beyond the three first-team centre-back options, you've got the young, then whoever comes from Barca B will be option five. I think that there is no point on spending any money um, because, you know, it's not just spending the money now. It's also paying the wages for however long this player stays, uh, given the financial situation for someone coming from a major club such as Chelsea or any of the Italian clubs or even premiership clubs. It doesn't make much more sense to me at all. Yeah, I actually do disagree with just one point there, and that is the one about uh, Pujar Alenya. I would actually keep Alenya this season because he's much better at getting the minutes that are going to be afforded to him. I think at this juncture in Pujar's career, he needs to play. He needs to be a starter in some kind of side and a top-level side and get those minutes. So I would say if, if Pujar is still going to be the backup backup and only get two or three more appearances for the rest of the year, uh, I guess not counting the Copa del Rey to see how far the team goes there. But yeah, I would actually make Alenya fourth double pivot option and then they let Puj actually get some minutes elsewhere or the hope would be that he would go and get some minutes elsewhere and that's actually something that I would really consider about a new board and I, I've been very critical of the loan moves that have been done under the Bartomeu era they I mean you're talking about a success rate of maybe five percent of the number of loans that players would leave for Barcelona and then it would come back and work and actually speaking of that one of the ones that did work was a Barca B loan last year in Arnaud Camas, and he has been a stalwart at the back for Pimienta this year. And when you mentioned about that fifth center back, because I do agree with you too that Frankie de Jong is the option as the other center back because he just allows you to do an in-game move where, let's say, Lengley or PK go down in any match, then de Jong moves back and you have Busquets and Pjanic as the double pivot. And I think that's something that Coleman has shown already, that he is much, much more comfortable with that option than throwing another youngster in the equation. And in this way, Araujo would be that that other youngster in the equation. So I, I don't think you really, truly need another center back. But as the update that was that you promised the listeners to, I have been watching Barca B and Juvenal A this season. And Juvenal A, those center backs, much too young. There you have Diego Almeida, and he is, I think, just still 16. So many, many years away from the Juvenal A situation for the center back position. But with Barca B, we've been talking about Ramos Mingo as a player to have great potential. But I have not really been excited about what I've seen from him so far. And then the other option you mentioned in Miguetha, I've never really been impressed with Miguetha either. He's always, even in the years, uh, previous seasons, where you've had a number of other center backs that have tried to work their way through and have since gone on from that time, Jorge Cuenca being the latest one. Miguetha was always basically the backup to them over the last few seasons. So I just don't think he has a level of the first team. But I have been really impressed by a player that went out on loan from Barca B last year in Anel Comas, who has come back. And again, he's a name that I keep throwing out there. It's only been three or four appearances that I've seen him. But he has been good in uh, in the rain against Andorra, as we talked about last week. And he's been good when the pitch was a little, say, a little more playable as well. So we are going to go back to a point, though, you made a question from Miles about our opinion of the club and calling it tr- a transition year. So he says we do talk about that, that it is a transition year and winning trophies, as you mentioned, Frances, should not be expected. But do you think that the club, Komen, and the players see this season as such a season where a transition year is what's happening and Coleman should expect it to be that way? Well, no, 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 of course not. Uh, for every player, I mean, I'm a footballer myself. Obviously, I'm not that good and I never was. But as a football player, uh, you don't think about transitions. You, it's all about the here and now. Um, obviously, linking to what we said about Umtiti, Umtiti at the time, thought that the best thing to do was to follow the advice of the French doctors and uh, three years on, look at where we are. So, no, there's no no transition years when you're a footballer and when you're a professional. Miles mentioned Kuman in his question. Um, Kuman is not going to ha- probably have any other opportunity ever to coach Barca. Um, it is very likely that if someone like Victor Font or whoever uh, ends up winning the presidency comes on, they're probably going to bring their own manager. So I don't think Kuman has another season managing Barca unless he does something spectacular this season, which obviously is, is we're far from at the moment and uh, remains to be seen. But no, he's, he's now or never for him, really. So he's always going to play 
the players that he thinks are going to give him the best product, are going to give him the best output. Um, as for the players, I mean, we need to start thinking about Messi first. Messi's probably halfway through his last season at Barca after arguably 20 years that we'll never get back from any player ever. So obviously he would definitely want to go out with a bang, uh, doing his best and obviously getting some trophies on the way. And then as for the other players, um, if you're one of the veterans, you know, that's another chance for you to win trophies. You don't have that many left and it's probably the last season you're going to play with Messi. And obviously the youngsters, um, there's no time to waste because they have to prove that they are at Barca for a reason. So um, there's no transitions here for any professional in any sport. Certainly not a footballer and certainly not a footballer that has got a contract at Barca. Um, it is more for us, when I keep saying about the transition year, it's more for, for me, to be honest, for me, it's a defence mechanism because, you know, when you've got Messi, Suarez, Neymar up front at the peak of their careers, then you sort of think that something is going to happen. Um, I think if you build your hopes up too high this year, um, you're probably going to be disappointed in the end. So for me, it is a transition season for, from that respect. Obviously, Bartomeu, luckily, is now gone, but it did take four months of the season for him to do so. There's going to be a board coming on, to be honest, not soon enough, um, with the election being called in January. So that's another three months in limbo, really, that we could have, um, if the board and the Carlos Tusquets Gestora, the, 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 the current board, uh, the, the, the group of people leading the club now, had actually done what I think is in the best interest of the club. The election would have been called earlier. So the time in limbo would have been reduced for, to probably six, seven weeks tops. Uh, but that's not the case. By the time the new board take charge, they were going to have to do an uh, auditoria, which is um, an audit looking at what the state of the club. That's going to take another month at least. And uh, if you fast forward, then you're probably going to be about to start the next season when the new board actually know what's going on. So because of all of those reasons, yes, it is a transition year. But if you're a footballer, you, you live for the here and now. Yeah, certainly. No player is going to admit that it is transition, though. I, the one thing I do want to say that a, a lot of kool I'm seeing, at least again in the cesspool of the Internet, are saying that Komen, by not playing Ricky Poos, is showing that he is managing for his job and isn't really going young. But the average starting lineup of Barcelona is the youngest it's been in almost a decade. And that just tells you that this is a team that is, I mean, he is utilizing youth. And I know people are already, because Pedri is being used by Komen, I mean, that's still a 17-year-old or now 18-year-old being used over and over and over again by Komen. And he, again, Fati was the leading scorer at the age of 18 years old as well. So it's not like, and throwing in Sergi, Serginho Dest to that mix, it's not like this is an old squad uh, by any means. Then, as we'd mentioned before, again, this is kind of rehashing as the international break usually has us do. We wind up repeating things. And so this is repeating a point that we made either last week or, or two weeks ago. Again, the days and the years seem to blend together me for me. But what we had already rehashed was that Coleman is needing to trust the players who have too important of a place in the squad. And we will see what happens with Busquets now, because this is a double pivot now with De Jong and Pjanic, that while they've only played 227 minutes together, Barca has only conceded one goal, that being a penalty, and scored seven with this double pivot. So we're actually going to see just how good they could potentially be. And we will see that against Atletico, as Vilmos asked, is there any chance of getting something out of the Atletico game? And to Vilmos, I would say, yes, there's something to be gotten out of every single game. And tactically, this isn't just me saying a net feeling or throwing, giving you the messy line, but Atletico play a 3-4-2-1 with Marcos Llorente and João Felix, who has been pretty incredible this season. Those two usually play underneath the striker, who was Luis Suarez. But we'll have to see if Simeone goes with Costa or someone else if Costa can't go. Now, Llorente and Felix are the ones I am worried about. Those two have been excellent this year, popping up between the lines. But that said... Juve was the team that played a similar way, and that was Barca's best full 90 of the season. So I think who really knows? And as I've said too, this squad just, they do have the talent, they do have the ability. It just winds up being everything going on that we do worry that they just don't have enough, you know, happening behind the scenes for them to support the squad. So we do worry about the results. But yeah, I think in any match, any individual match, but you also look at it too, that if Barca with their games at hand, Atletico has their games in hand too. If Atletico beats Barcelona in this match, Barca are going, it's true, Barca are going to have a very hard time, not just talking about Real Madrid, but they'll have a hard time jumping Atletico Madrid to try to get to the top of the Liga table. But if Barca wind up getting the three points and go out and handle Atletico Madrid by 
I, I can't imagine anything more than a 2 nothing scoreline. But if that winds up being the final in this match, well, then you're talking about an entirely different La Liga race because Atletico Madrid so far have put themselves in the position to be the favorites. And I, I don't know if you guys saw last week, but I put out that video about Real Sociedad. They've done a really, really good job building their squad and they've got a, a great club situation going on there behind the scenes and on the field using youth while also adding the pieces that they need. And Atletico Madrid, they're a team just like Real and Barca that, I mean, they're playing okay but they're not really having their best season either. But they're actually, I think, the most likely title contenders at this moment from what we've seen at Barca and Real Madrid, not saying from what we've seen of Atletico. So this winds up being a really, really important match. I I think we all understand that, but it doesn't mean that Barca are just going to roll over to Atletico Madrid. No, I agree, I agree. Um, I think that, I don't want to repeat what you said. Um, I agree with what you said. So um, my only point to add is that I think Barca are in more danger to hurting themselves when they're playing against a team that is, in theory, a lesser team. Um, in other words, playing against Juventus, Atletico Madrid, Real Madrid, etc., that's when the current team can step up. That's when the current team, you know, know they have to put all, all the senses into the game and put their hearts and souls on the pitch. And I really don't think that that is where the danger is at this time of the season. I mean, it's still November. I think that Come the decisive stage, so March, April, hopefully May as well, we're still in contention for all the titles by then, then that's when the rotation should have had the effect so that the players continue to be fit at that point. But, you know, we've been doing the podcast for nearly three or four years now, and uh, we're always sort of wary, or we have been always sort of wary about Barca making it to that time of the season. But... The point you just made about the the squad being rejuvenated lately, I'm not that wary, I'm not that scared, I'm not that worried about us running out of fuel at the end of the season because there's so many youngsters that basically, they're very young youngsters. I know that doesn't really make sense, but you know what I mean? You've got 17-year-olds, you've got 19-year-olds, you've got uh, 21-year-olds in, obviously, um, in Frankie de Jong, etc. So... I'm not worried about that. I think that the, the 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 progress of the team this season, the um, cohesion, the understanding of the system, the growth and the, the potential for progress that we've got this season is um, is much greater than we've ever had, certainly in recent years. So I am excited for that. But at this point of the season, I think playing a big match is just about getting the tactics right. It's getting the Kuman getting the starting eleven right. And then everyone pulling together. I think that we can beat any team, but unfortunately, right now, at this moment in time, we can also be beaten by everybody. So it's just about uh, putting all the pieces together and getting a collective unit that can go for victory. We got a question from Patreon Ayan. How likely do you see the possibility of Conrad being used as a left back in his? career. Now, uh, Frances, I know not only do you not watch the international break, but you particularly don't watch the U.S. matches during the international break. So I took that burden on and it was actually exciting. We saw Yunus Musa, who is a winger for Valencia, but naturally a center back. So he was exciting. I'll just throw that name out there that if Barca ever need to find another player in La Liga when they can actually afford somebody in two or three or four or five or six seasons uh, and ES Moriba doesn't work out. I mean, Musa has been pretty good for the men's national team. But more importantly, Conrad De La Fuente made his debut for the U.S. against Wales, so he has not yet featured for first team for Barcelona, though he has warmed up a lot, if that matters, and it winds up being Brothwaite who just keeps coming on. But if Brothwaite is moved on in January, then you'd expect that Conrad De La Fuente will finally get his opportunity to debut for Barcelona at the ripe old age of 19. That said, against Wales, he did struggle, and this being a makeshift U.S. team, so don't read too much into it, but he has shown that he just doesn't have enough reps and enough consistency yet to really be the top, top player. But he's, as I've mentioned many, many times, he's shown in the last year that he was a guy who maybe didn't look like he was at Barcelona in the future to being a player that has shown that he has the potential and he does have flashes. He just now needs to work on his consistency. And that should be hopefully with some time with Barca B as they continue to get playing. But if that is with a few appearances with the first team, Barca's first team is able to raise his level. When speaking about him as a left back, I know that that idea was thrown out, but you can't just kind of plug and play. I, I jokingly said that that, yeah, it would be a possibility if the left back spot is, is needed. But I would rather even Alejandro Balde, if he wasn't completely ready, I would still rather put a natural left back in that position than try to move Conrad de 
Fuente. He just isn't ready at this point in his career to be taken away from what he should be working on. Is and that is his positioning, his timing his runs, and getting some consistency at the particularly the left wing spot. So I would say in his career, maybe somewhere down the road in the way that Sergio Roberto was moved to right back, sure. But at this point in his career being 19, I think we are still a ways away from trying to change his position. And Frances, that's a question for you even, because I've mentioned that Carlos Alenia, that is a player that I would, if you're really experimenting and I was a manager, I would attempt to see what Alenia could do with the left back position just because he is left footed and defensively he has some of the intelligence and acumen that you would get playing a defensive midfield role as he's done multiple times in his career already. So that's kind of what I almost profile and think about. But where do you stand on, and I know it is player by player basis, but where do you stand on, on changing a player's position? I think that a player that has come through La Masia can pretty much play any position. Um, you can see with Sergio Roberto, um, when growing up through La Masia, he was an attacking midfielder. Um, a lot of the time, though, he played in the pivot, in the traditional Busquets or Pep Guardiola or Guillermo Amor position uh, that's behind the interiores. Um, and he's playing at right back at first team level. I think Alanya is a very similar player to Sergi Roberto, obviously left footed, so he could definitely play as a left back as well. Um, Ricky Puch could do that job as well, to be honest, but obviously every player is different. If Alanya was to go into left back, though, you would just have, in my eyes, a copy of Sergi Roberto. So that would be someone who would not be <laughs> running the byline. He's not particularly speedy as such, yeah. but he's someone who in possession is, is better, he's reliable and will be able to associate well. Um, I, I, when I was playing, I was always a fullback, um, normally a right back because I'm right footed, but I could play on the left as well. That was never a problem. Obviously, that enabled me to go into the middle and actually take a shot with my with my right foot. So, no, I think that playing fullback is not that difficult, to be honest. You just have to know when to go forward, when to push forward, how to associate. Um, but obviously, there is a degree of risk taking coming back. And uh, I think that you always have to have someone that would cover when you go. So, for example, Rakitic used to do this very well, especially in his early years, whenever Dani Alves used to zoom forward. So he's someone to, who can do the coberturas, who can cover you when you go. Um, so I think that it is positive that we finally have a coach that actually enables that and, and can see the future. I think we've got someone now in Kuman, obviously, that um, values youth and he's making some changes and some experiments that will eventually work out well for him. It may not necessarily be this season, but I think that, honestly, in four or five years' time, we will be really grateful to what Kuman is doing now by giving youth a chance because that could possibly be the core of the future winning team that we're so eagerly awaiting. Yeah, I agree. I, I think even though Fati debuted and played last season, I, you do get the sense that this is chapter one of a new cycle, of a new time. And I know even Messi is still in the team, and it feels weird to say that. But you really get the sense that this is step one, that, that Bayern Munich, that 8-2, is the end of a chapter uh, finishing up. And that's a really good point, too, about in La Masia. They do play all these different positions. We've talked about Ricky Puj in the past, playing as a false nine and moving back to an attacking midfielder, now being forced almost to be a double pivot. Uh, if he wants to see the field and... PK the same way he started as a center forward and obviously became a center back where he's played his entire professional career. So you do see guys in La Masia playing multiple positions. And I would mention too, as we wrap this up, uh, not only was it Conrad Del Fuente who played against Wales, but Serginho Dest also played the full 90 in both matches over this international window. And then against a, I mean, this is a C or D list Panama team. So players that certainly on the Barcelona podcast, you would have never heard of. But Serginho Dest wound up playing at the left back position. And on that conversation we had about the left back spot earlier, in the same way that Frankie de Jong before you're going to see a B-team player called up, I would actually expect that it's going to be Dest filling in for Alba. Basically, as well, as we talked about when he arrived, that we've seen that Ronald Coleman, after giving Sergino Dest a little bit of a run out on arrival, it now looks like it is Alba and Roberto as the regular starters. But I think Dest is the backup for both the right-back position and the left-back position. So you're really speaking of a situation where, yes, if both of them went down, something would need to happen. But I do think that it is still Dest, much like De Young. He is the backup to that left-back spot. So I think you can table the Conrad as left-back talk for quite some time. But I'm going to end it on a high note this week that, yes, Atletico Madrid is going on. But 
at least all I watched for the last week. I saw a little, dabbled in a little bit of European matches. Sure, I watched Scotland wind up making the European Championship for the first time in in 20 years. So I guess there's some exciting things going on around Europe. But I did watch the U.S. men's national team, and I was just again filled with the hope that. Barca have got some players, and they have brought in some players like a Serginho Des, and that kid has got some sauce. He is phenomenal on the ball, and he is unafraid of anything. And when we were talking even about the mentality of, of Javier Mascherano, I just want to also bring up him as we end this show. He is retiring, and I wrote something about him on BarcaBlog.com. But when we talk about mentality, this team has not had the right mentality now for going on three seasons where they have wilted under pressure. But the more and more I see of player, a player like Shadino Dest, and I'm hoping that Pedri has a similar thing, that Trincao has a similar thing. But what I have seen of Dest so far is this is not a player that is going to wilt in the moment that you saw when he was playing against Real Madrid in El Clasico as a teenager having just arrived at the Camp No. This is a kid who is fearless. And that is what I want to continue to see from new players that Barcelona bring in and any La Masia player that comes up. These are the, the qualities that I want to see. Yes, as I said, physically and technically, Serginho Des has, is a good player who's got some sauce, has a little bit to learn defensively as a teenager, but this is a kid that mentally is already showing that he has got what it takes, and that is what I want to see. I want to see more players that you look in their eyes like you saw in Javier Mascherano's eyes, and you know that they are not going to give up a three-goal lead again. That is the one and only thing, really, truly, the one and only thing I want to see more than any other from these young players. They're going to be talented when they're bought by Barcelona, yes, but I want to see in their eyes that they are unafraid of the moment. Do you know what I want to see? I want to see Sergio Ramos taking more penalties for Spain. That would be a great, great, great thing to yeah. see going forward as well. Yeah, some of that in the Liga would be great. If he could get, a, a, yeah, sure, he's going to get the La Liga penalties. We know he's going to be taking them all the time for Real Madrid. Yes, but some misses would be awesome. Of course, of course. And if he doesn't score those, then he'll get more penalties. Um, VAR, you know, he's got a very, very clear white collar behind them. Um, this is the time in the podcast in which I say something depressing. So I'm just going to say nothing. Dan, back to you. Yeah, so I'm going to just say thank you for joining me again, Frances, and thank you for tuning into the app. Again, a little bit of a different show, so thanks for LaRonda. Thanks for our listeners for submitting their questions for the last two weeks of shows as we make it through and survive the international break because now things are hot and heavy once again. Weekends, weekdays, Champions League, group stage once again. So the matches are going to be coming quickly as we go into the holiday season, if you will. So again, thanks so much for tuning in. You can tap in your app and check out the show notes to subscribe, as well as check out our link to Fanati. So if you sign up for Fanati's, which is a great service, make sure you use our link down in the description for that. You can also find us on social media. We're on Twitter at the Barcelona Pod or at Hilton D13 for me and on Instagram at the Barcelona Pod. That closed Facebook group, tvpod.link backslash group. That's where we get the deeper dive discussions, but also the questions from La Ronda. So you can answer the questions there and get in the group. As long as you answer the questions, you get approved. And then on Patreon, you can help us continue to make these shows at tbbot.link backslash Patreon. And I do say special thank you to all of our new Patreons for as little as even $3 a month. You just help us make these shows. So we are also on YouTube, the Barcelona podcast, where there's some specialty content coming out each and every week over there. So check us out, hit that subscription button. And thanks so much for listening to the Barcelona podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. And Forza Barca. Forza. Forza.